On more than 300 miles away, a crack in the case of a San Antonio woman missing for more than three years. How a private citizen helped investigators identify the woman. The captain says he was pushed out. The constable says she was just doing her job. That was one of my missions to find out what was going on. At the center of it all, faulty record keeping at a Bear County constable's office. The defenders with Wyatt left the constable's office vulnerable. This year is even more special because we get to help people get back to normal with our beautiful community. The city of New Braunfels is ready for people to visit. How River Outfitters are preparing for Memorial Day weekend crowds. Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. And we begin tonight with a night beat update in the case of a missing San Antonio woman. The head of a woman found in Louisiana identified as belonging to Sally Hines, who vanished more than three years ago. Investigators say the identification would not have happened without the help of sketch artists and a private citizen's detective work. This is the photo police released in their search for 58 year old Sally Hines back in December 2017. She was last seen at her Northwest side home. At the time, police mentioned she suffered a medical condition. Her, fa her family described it as dementia. Then in March of 2018, a head was found in Louisiana. The following year, a computer generated facial recognition was released. The image was done by LSU Faces Lab and investigators confirm a private citizen went through pictures to try and see if they match this sketch. Sheriff Ron Johnson in the Cameron Parish of Louisiana says he received a tip last Thursday of a person who looked like the rendering. Just yesterday, dental records confirmed the remains belonged to Hines. This just in tonight, a murder suspect caught in Madison County near Houston just brought back to Bear County. This is the latest mugshot for 26 year old Keith Corley. And it was just released to us tonight. Records show he was booked into the Bear County Jail just after one this afternoon. He's accused of killing 24 year old Delon Weaver in front of Weaver's four year old son. The shooting happened earlier this week outside an apartment complex on Upland Drive. Again, Corley arrested in Madison County is now back in Bear County to face charges. And you on the night beat a captain with a Bear County Constable's office leaves the agency after an audit uncovers faulty record keeping. He tells the night team's Dylan Collier new leadership went to extreme measures to push him out. The constable of precinct four now defending her actions. It's tonight's defenders report. <laughs> Before she was elected Bear County Constable for Precinct 4, Catherine Brown heard a troubling allegation while on the campaign trail last year that deputies no longer with the agency were still on its roster of personnel, a massive potential liability she then feared she'd inherited after winning the election and taking office January 1st. And so the minute I got here, that was one of my missions to find out what was going on and how it should be rectified and who is responsible for it. An audit done by the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement weeks later uncovered significant issues with Precinct 4's paperwork, including firearms qualification forms and criminal history checks that were missing. The personnel files for a vast majority of deputies analyzed were out of compliance. And despite the training coordinator in charge of the files, Captain Arthur Burford, claiming issues in a separate 2018 audit had been corrected, this year's audit found that some of those same files were still out of compliance. Someone who has more than 20 years experience and someone who has had that capability and that responsibility and training to back it up should have been very well made aware of what they were doing. My job is to make sure you don't get blindsided. Reached for comment at his house, Burford acknowledged problems with his record keeping, but said what Brown did next was over the top. So I saw the writing on the wall, and I didn't like what I saw. Two days after the audit was finished, Brown demoted Burford from captain to deputy, forced him to clear out his office, and return a majority of his equipment. What role could he have continued to play moving forward if he doesn't even have, let's say, access to the office? Um, he could have played a, a normal role as a regular deputy. Burford says he felt he had no choice but to retire and walk away. I've been in the precinct for 29 years. And whether you were a defendant, a plaintiff, a person who had a 
uh, disagreement or a complaint to take. I treated you with respect. Constable Brown said the training issues were caught soon enough to keep Precinct 4 from being reprimanded by the state. She also gave Burford an honorable discharge, telling us she felt like the letter of reprimand and the demotion was punishment enough for his paperwork miscues. For the Defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. More vaccinations are happening. A little over 62% of those eligible in Bear County have received one dose of the vaccine. 48% are fully vaccinated. A reminder, Six Flags is partnering with the city to give free tickets for vaccinations. We have details on KSAT.com. And when it comes to COVID-19 cases, 134 five COVID-19 patients are in the hospital. Our seven day average has dropped to 126 cases per day. Three deaths were also reported. Meantime, a memorial dedicated to those who lost their lives from COVID-19 currently stands downtown tonight. It's called Deep in Our Hearts and is made up of more than 3,400 hearts. While some left flowers, others left photos and messages in honor of their loved ones. The memorial site at the corner of Market and South Alamo Street will be available to the public for about a month. A jury selection set to begin tomorrow. It's all in preparation for the in-person trial scheduled for next week. A little indication we're returning to normal. The selection process will continue to keep the pandemic in mind, though. We're going to qualify up to 500 people through virtual means. So they're all going to appear on computer screens. I'm going to be talking to them through a computer screen. It's all part of the new normal. People will be questioned, and if any exemptions arise, they'll be discussed. Judge Ron Hell says safety protocols will still be followed within the courtroom. Our Paul Venema has covered many historic cases in the courtroom in his 47-year-long career here at KSAT. Tonight, friends and family threw a special dinner for him. He was surprised there was also a special crown and sash provided for the man of <laughs> honor. Paul's made many friends along the way, all showing up to send their well wishes. You can share your well wishes too. We have a virtual card you can sign and add a special message to Paul online right now on KSAT.com. And join us tomorrow at 630. Paul Venema joins us for a very special KSAT Q&A. Temperatures out there right now for the most part right around 80 degrees, 79 Canyon Lake, 79 Bandera, 81 Pleasanton and Divine at 80, officially in San Antonio, 80 degrees. Tomorrow morning we'll wake up to temperatures in the 70s, low clouds, high humidity. The new drought monitor is in. I'm excited to bring that to you in a few minutes along with our next storm chances, which are right around the corner. All that coming up. Thank you, Adam. It's a scene we haven't witnessed in a while. A crowd of people gathered together that's what happened in Legacy Park tonight near the new Frost Tower. 1,200 people expected for the downtown Tech District Reboot Rally. The large outdoor event comes weeks before Fiesta, bless you, and during the transition out of the pandemic. Tech Block CEO David Hurd says tech industry startups essentially stalled during the pandemic. Tonight's rally meant to renew life for the downtown Tech District and show off a part of town Hurd says is filled with places to live, work, play and learn. Tech jobs and companies are on the move a little bit across the U.S. and we'd like to lure more of those tech jobs to our city. The Tech District downtown is an attractive place for those workers to locate in those companies, but it needs our help. The Central San Antonio, which is a sponsor for the event, says this is the biggest event downtown since the pandemic began. Well, now to a night beat update. They showed off their shoes and made it to the top five spot. Tonight, art students from Edison High School learned they won a prize of $15,000 for their San Antonio inspired shoes. Students and teachers were all smiles today. Lead artist Rogelio Zamaripa says having students represent San Antonio through art was a wonderful opportunity. You know, um, so I think it's very important um, that art could be highlighted. And I'm glad that we highlighted it within our district, within our city, and to show that it's something important that students need, I believe. And it's, it's a type of counseling, a type of therapy, and it's, I enjoy it. I love it. This check is an investment for the futures to come. 
This, by the way, was sponsored by Vans Shoes. The $15,000 will help support the art program with making repairs, buying new art supplies, cameras, and iPads. Congratulations, Edison. You know what? With those creative designs, they were a shoe in. Exactly. <laughs> Still ahead on the night beat, San Antonio <laughs> students marking the end of a school year, the celebration that had HEB and the San Antonio Food Bank involved. And as summer break begins, some might be looking to cool off by floating the river. How the city of New Braunfels is preparing for the crowds. Coming up next on the night beat. It is a different scene than last year in New Braunfels. Locals and tourists taking to the river once again. Our night team's Jonathan Cotto spoke with people in New Braunfels who are gearing up for Memorial Day weekend crowds. It's not even the weekend and the Comal River is already seeing its fair share of visitors. Yeah! But the turnout is expected to be much more come Memorial Day. So during those big holiday weekends, uh, the New Braunfels Police Department does have extra river patrols. Those patrols are there every weekend during the summer, but in particular on those busy holiday weekends. New Braunfels Mayor Rusty Brockman says the safety and well-being of guests is a priority. He says it's nice to see people getting back to normal. Last summer was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking because of the pandemic that we were all dealing with and knowing how devastating it was to our families and our community, but then it was also heartbreaking to know that our visitors and guests could not come and enjoy our beautiful place. While masks aren't required on the river, Brockman says they encourage people to maintain their distance. He says all other park rules haven't changed and must be followed. We want young kids to be wearing the, the life vests. We want people to be safe when they get in the water. Uh, everyone knows that What's underneath the water not is not always seen. Shane Wolf, general manager at Rock and Roll River Ride, says being back in business is certainly a blessing, considering they had to shut down last year. He says they employ over 150 people. Coming into this season, uh, all the outfitters, the CVB, the Chamber, the city, we're all just excited to have everybody come back. Uh, no question at all. Doors are wide open, arms are open, and excited for all of it. Thank you. For this bunch, the opportunity to be out on the river with friends is one they certainly don't take for granted. Just be able to get out, hang out with your friends and do it safely, I think is great. You gotta stay safe, even though this virus did hit, that doesn't mean that other things can't happen. So just being precautious and what's going on. Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. Students at Pre-K for USA are ready for summer. They celebrated the end of the school year with a drive through parade on Eisenhower Road. With help from HEB and the San Antonio Food Bank, students were also given bags of fruit and vegetables to encourage a healthy start to summer break. Kids should be focused on fun in the sun, outdoor play. Kids shouldn't be worried about where their next meal's coming from. We get to partner with our food bank and come out here. We're just excited when we get to come along and enjoy the celebrations like we have here today. There were also some other fun items like bubbles, sunglasses, and a book for summer reading. Noah Vinzi Adams. The end of one chapter, a bright start to a new path. Noah Adams reached his goals of beating cancer and graduating from Central Catholic High School. We followed his journey right here on the Night Beat. His leg had to be amputated to help remove a rare form of bone cancer. He underwent chemo. He is now thriving with his prosthetic. He's set to go to the University of Pittsburgh to study psychology. Way to go, Noah. Can't wait to see what he yes, does next. Yes, congratulations. Meantime, let's turn now to weather. 81 degrees out there. Nice night all in all, but a little bit on the muggy side. Yeah, absolutely muggy. You know, we had that uh, tubing story earlier. Yeah. Right, right in the river. If I were to pick one day this weekend, it would be Sunday. The other day should be okay, but personally, I just think the best day would be Sunday. A little yeah. extra sun, not as much in terms of clouds, you know. So you're saying that day would be totally tubular. <laughs> Cowabunga, bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we need to move on. So we do have our updated drought monitor, and I'm really excited to share that with you, and we're going to compare it to what it looked like one month ago. It's just 
amazing the changes. It's great. We love it. Good positive news there. Our pattern is going to get a little messy, especially as we get into next week, but even Friday night uh, we're going to see uh, some action out there. Leftover showers and storms is what our pattern is going to com come to. Basically not storms developing over us, but we get the leftovers coming in from different parts of Texas. That's why it gets messy. It's kind of those wait and see situations. We'll get to that in a minute. Let's start with the drought monitor. Look at this four weeks ago today. See all that red across South and Central Texas. Yeah, we were in a, an extreme and even exceptional drought, but here we go. Look at that. We just wiped away and erased most of that drought across our area. Obviously, we could still use a few showers, especially along the border. Del Rio to Quemado to Eagle Pass or Carrizo Springs, Catula and even down into Laredo. Even parts of the hill country could f use a few more showers. We don't necessarily need it around town but we still kind of want it. I'd like to boost the aquifer a little bit more. Where it's most needed is West Texas, far West Texas and even the Western Panhandle. And actually they did pick up some showers earlier today. And even Valverde County, where we need the rain over the past couple of hours, had a few leftover showers move in. This is what we'll be dealing with in the days ahead, especially next week. These were bigger thunderstorm complexes and even severe storms. And to get to our area, we just get the leftovers of them. But we still at least have some rain going over parts of drought stricken Valverde County, especially northern Valverde County, that activity coming to an end very shortly. Here's the wider view. These yellow polygons indicate the the watch boxes, the severe thunderstorm watches that are still in effect. And what we're looking for tonight into tomorrow is this line that's coming together about to cross the Red River. And this is what we're going to be dealing with a lot in the days ahead. Not storms developing over us, but storms elsewhere and then it's a race against the clock to figure out, figure out exactly where they're going to go and win. Right now, odds favor this complex moving into North Texas to push just east of San Antonio. There is a chance, though. I do think a 10 to 20 percent chance that it could clip us around sunrise tomorrow morning. Right now, odds favor it missing us. We go through the day tomorrow. We get in a little bit of sunshine and then we look for more development off to the north and across the border in the mountains of Mexico, where we usually see those showers and storms pop up. So we'll watch to the north, watch to the west, see how they evolve and develop. And should they even organize and come together, then it would increase our odds of those scattered storms by tomorrow night. And that's why we've got that 40% chance in place. So let's talk about this temperatures. Today was average 89 degrees for the high. Right now we're at 72 or 72 degree dew point. 80 degree temperature, but a very muggy out there. And for the most part, we're near 80 locally. We get into the 80s closer to the Rio Grande and we'll start the day tomorrow in the 70s and then by the afternoon, make it back up to near the 90 degree mark, becoming partly cloudy with that chance of those scattered storms later on in the day. I've got it at 30% at 5 p.m., but by 9 and midnight, I've got it up to 40%. It's one of those situations where we have to watch the evolving storms and then play it by, you know, basically game time decisions to keep you updated. As for the weekend, maybe a stray shower Saturday and Monday, but by and large, dry, humid and temperatures a little below average in the mid 80s. All right. Thank you, Adam. All right. So in what was an unusual season, the Cowboys made some COVID discoveries. Yeah, and you know, it's funny, whenever you have a bad season, you always look for a few bright spots, and we have a couple to highlight for you tonight, including one of their star cornerbacks. When we come back, how about a rookie having to go through their first season without any offseason? We'll have that story for you, plus the fallout for bad behavior in the NBA playoffs involving fans and Russell Westbrook. Coming up. The Philadelphia 76ers have banned a fan from the Wells Fargo Center and his season tickets have been revoked after he dumped popcorn on an injured Russell Westbrook on his way to the locker room for treatment. The incident occurred during the fourth quarter of last night's game two of the NBA playoffs between the Sixers and the Washington Wizards. Westbrook suffered the injury to his right ankle in the fourth quarter of the Wizards 120 to 95 loss. It happened with about 10 and a half minutes to play in the game to go down two nothing in this best of seven series. The incident was caught on camera and then replayed as event security escorted the fan from the Wells Fargo Center after being pointed out by other fans fans. Pro football government, powered by Davis Law Firm. One of the few bright spots in the Dallas Cowboys 6-10 season last year was Trayvon Diggs. His second round pick was thrown into the fire, starting 12 games as a rookie cornerback, including the season opener, wound up with three interceptions, and he had to do it without any offseason thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, as he reports for his first ever organized team activity in his second season in the NFL, he gets to go up against one of the best young wide receivers in the league, C.D. Lamb. 
this is all new to me, you know, so it's actually a blessing. Uh, I'm actually happy we can do this and we can get together, you know, with the guys and get all these reps in. And, you know, I'm really enjoying it, you know, uh, Hanging out with the uh, with the new the new guys on the team, um, you know, getting to know the, know the new coaching staff, and you know, just creating a vibe. So, you know, this is really good that you know everybody's here, you know, everybody's coming to work, and you know, we're having fun with it, and you know, grinding at the same time. So, you know, like I said, it's creating a, a good vibe, good energy uh, around the building, and good energy in the room. So, you know, I, I'm excited for it. Another player that produced during the COVID-19 pandemic was tight end Dalton Schultz. Now the backup to Blake Jarwin at tight end was forced into action after Jarwin's season came to an abrupt end in the first game of the season when he tore his ACL. Schultz would have to step up and he did in just his third season in the NFL with a career high 63 receptions for 615 yards and four touchdowns. Now with Jarwin on the men and continuing his rehabilitation, the Cowboys look to have two healthy and strong tight ends to start the NFL season on September the 9th against the defending Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I'm so excited to see him back on the field because I, I mean, the ACLs are brutal, um, especially to go down like that in game one. Um, he's put so much hard work and time in. Um, he's still got a lot. He's still got a ways to go. Um, but I, dude, I, I can't wait to see him um, finally go out and and prove to everybody that he's the tight end that you know everybody thinks he is. And um, I'm excited to have that that two headed monster in the room that you know hopefully we can take advantage of some defenses this year. How about that? A two tight end set. Unlike the Dallas Cowboys, today was the first day of organized team activities for the Houston Texans that media was allowed to attend the workouts, and reporters were welcome with rosters with no numbers for the players who are working out. Remember, new general manager Nick Casario comes from the New England Patriots, an organization that did everything it could to keep the media in the dark, especially when it came to injuries. And only the defense is on the field today at the Texas training facility at NRG Stadium Complex. Basically, what it is is just that we've created competition. And basically, we've created competition at all positions. And, and, and that's what we want to see, and that's what we want to get done out there. And that's what's happening right now. It's really not so much the numbers as it much as it so much as is is that they look there's competition at all positions out there. And and that's the that was the intention of when we put this roster together was to create that. And that's what's happening right now. All right, high school softball and baseball playoffs next. Game one of the Class 6A region final between Austin Bowie Bulldogs and Judson. The game had to be moved to New Braunfels after all the rain this week flooded the softball field of Buda. Judson was in a deep hole down 7 0 in the fourth here before the Rockets started to fire. Lauren Ramos smashes the pitch over the center field fence and the rally is on. Very next batter, very next pitch. Emily Ayala goes deep over the center field fence and the lead is down to five. Later in the inning, two on. For for Keely Williams, since this one out of the park, a three-run blast brings home Samara Sanchez and Alia Alia Pacheco to make it a two-run game, and the Rockets rallied to win it 14-10. Game one of the 6A regional semifinals in baseball north side field between the Eagle Pass Eagles, Smith and Valley Rangers, top of the second. Rangers down one nothing. Cameron Hodges at the play. Christian Keller on third. Hodges puts that pitch to deep right, but it wouldn't be enough to bring home Keller. There will be a play at the plate, and he is safe. Game tied at one. Top of the six now. Rangers down one again, but the bases are low for Tim Arguello. He comes through with the base at the center field. Keller scores easily, but will Hodges make it before the throw? He slides for the go-ahead run. The Rangers take game one, four to two. All right, Class 4A regional semifinals on campus at St. Mary's University. Navarro taking on Cal Allen Panthers up 2 nothing. top of the four. Two on Will Boswell knocks a base hit into right. Marco Moncada is going to beat the throw home, sliding in to give Navarro a 3 nothing lead. But the Wildcats strike back at the bottom half of the frame. Base is loaded. Talik Hickman chops a base hit right up the middle. Alex Salinas scores. Cal Allen puts eight runs on the board to take an 8-3 lead. They take game one by a final of 9-4. UI outclass 3A regional semifinals at Jordan High School. Marion taking on London in game one. Bulldogs trailing 1-0 to the top of the second. After Jaden Williams reaches third on a triple, Ty Blake brings home with a RBI ground out. Just sliding under that tag at home. We're tied at one all. Top of the fourth. Game tied at two. Pitch gets away at home play. Chance Lowry scores to give the Bulldogs their first lead of the game 3-2. London rallies to win the first game 5-4. They take game two as well, 10 to two. Marion season comes to an end. Thanks to everybody who went out tonight and shot these games. That was tough this evening. Exciting games. You got it. Thank you, Greg. I'll be right back. That's it for the night beat. GMSA starts at 4.30. Good night.